Hi everyone, welcome to today's webinar titled Top 10 User Story Tips. Thank you all for joining us. Please note this session is being recorded and the recording will be available within one to two business days on our website at ce.uci.edu. You can visit our free events page or our YouTube channel to view the recording. My name is Anna Yoshida, and I am the program representative for the Business Analysis Certificate Program here at UCI Continuing Education. So for today, I'll first start with a quick overview of Zoom features so you'll know how to submit questions throughout the presentation. Uh, next, I'll be giving you some information about our fully online Business Analysis Certificate Program. I will cover the requirements, fees, registration details uh, regarding upcoming courses for our spring quarter, which begins in April. I will then turn it over to our guest presenter, Angela Wick. And at the end of the presentation, we will have a brief Q&A session. And finally, I will leave you with my contact information so you can send over any additional questions we didn't get to address. If you look at the top or bottom of your screen, you should see a row of icons. Click on the chat bubble icon and the panel will pop up. If you encounter any technical difficulties during the webinar, please send a chat message over to John at UCI Support, uh, and he will help you troubleshoot any issues. If you have a question for me or Angela regarding the content of this presentation, please submit it in the chat, and we will address it at the end if we have time. And please be sure to send your questions to all panelists. Here is a brief overview of the Business Analysis Certificate Program. Our program provides the knowledge and skills needed to perform effective business analysis and provide better value on your process improvement project. And the program is taught by industry experts and the program will help you become proficient in all aspects of business analysis and including skills such as analytical thinking and problem solving. The certificate program is composed of four required courses which add up to 12 units total. To be eligible for this certificate, students must complete all four classes with a letter grade of C or better, um, as well as a completed declaration of candidacy form. Um, this form can be thought of as declaring a major. And since there is a small candidacy fee, I typically advise students to take the first class in our program before they declare just to make sure they want to complete the entire program. And to receive the certificate after completing all the requirements, uh, students must submit a request for certificate form, um, and all requirements must be completed within five years. And as I mentioned before, our program is, consists of four online courses. Uh, the required courses are shown here on this slide. This is a screenshot of our course schedule on our website. Uh, each course is three units and will run for 10 weeks online. We highly recommend that students start off with the fundamentals class and follow the sequence of courses as shown on our website. Um, the curriculum has been developed to flow from one course to the next, so taking courses in this sequence is beneficial. You can find course dates, textbook information, and enroll in any of the available courses by clicking the green online button. The to be scheduled indicates when we plan to offer particular courses in future quarters. Um, and as you can see, we don't offer every course every quarter, so you do want to plan ahead. Uh, for the upcoming spring 2019 quarter, we are offering the first three courses. Um, each course is listed with the start and end date by clicking on those green buttons. Enrollment is currently open and students may enroll either online or over the phone by calling our student services office uh, provided in the top right corner of this slide. We encourage students to enroll early, at least two weeks before the classes start, um, since classes can fill up quickly. Each course in our program costs $725, so you are looking at a total of $2,900 in course fees for the four classes, and you pay for each course as you enroll, opposed to an entire tuition sum at once. Um, there are also two required textbooks for this program and used in every single course. Uh, that would be IIBA's BayBot Guide and TMI's Guide to Business Analysis. The total for both books is around $125 if you purchase them from their website. 
Um, students can purchase their textbooks from the vendor of their choice. So this is this number is just an estimate. Uh, there is also a $125 candidacy for the program that I mentioned earlier. So in the end, you're looking at about $3,150 for the entire certificate program. I'd also like to specifically point out information about a special discount we offer for this program. Uh, we offer 10% off course fees to members of IIBA Orange County and IIBA's Los Angeles chapters. If you are a member of one of these chapters, please visit your chapter website for more information and for the discount code. And at this time, it is my pleasure to turn it over to Angela so she can provide an introduction and begin her portion of the presentation. Thank you, Anna. Thanks so much. And good morning, everybody. Well, morning, that is, if you're on the West Coast, right? So uh, I, as well, am on the West Coast, um, broadcasting from Santa Barbara, California, my new home. I moved here recently. So uh, I'm so happy to be in the sunshine, although it's been quite rainy lately, as we know. Uh, so excited to be here to talk about the top 10 user story tips. So really, really popular, popular presentation that I give that really is quite earth shaking for a lot of folks who are just starting out with user stories or maybe you've written a lot of them and just aren't aware that maybe these tips could edge you into a totally different sphere of performance. So. Uh, a little background uh, about myself, um, some tidbits that are fun to know. Um, I own a company called BA Squared, and besides that, though, there's some kind of fun things that I do, and one of them is LinkedIn Learning or lynda.com. So if you have a LinkedIn Premium account or lynda.com or Enterprise LinkedIn Learning account, you can find some classes out there on business analysis and Agile BA, Agile product owner of mine. I think I've got about 10 of them out there. And then um, BAcube.com is my uh, newest venture, where it's a website where um, you can get a free or a paid subscription to and get all kinds of tips and quick tip videos and all kinds of good learning stuff going on there. So check that out. Uh, also, as Anna mentioned, the program here at UCI leverages the BA Bach and the PMI BA Guide. And I was really fortunate to be part of both of those teams the author and expert teams to put together those publications. So excited to have that connection with you guys as well. So to warm up our, um, our webinar today, I'd like everybody to warm up their chat muscles. So find that chat window. And if you could chat in where you are dialing in from. So just the city or city and state, perhaps you're not in Southern California. So I just put mine in. Hi, I'm Angela Wick. Carlos, thank you, calling in from Santa Ana. San Clemente, thank you very much. Ooh, Texas on the line. All right, excellent, excellent. Um, getting those chat muscles warmed up, um, what I'd love to be able to do is have you feel free to enter questions or comments into the chat window throughout the hour of the webinar. It's kind of fun when there's a little back conversation going on. I don't see that as rude at all. I see that as fun. It's a bit of a challenge for me to keep up with you and your chats as well as presenting, but I see that as a fun thing to do, keeps me on my toes, and lets me know that you're out there and awake, if you know what I mean. So. Excellent, lots of folks uh, dialing in from different parts of, it looks like a lot of Texas and California going on. Excellent. Well, what I would love to know too from you in that chat window is if you've written user stories before. So curious if you could put a number into the chat window, maybe it's a zero, I'm brand new to it, never written one, or maybe you're in the like thousand plus range. I've written tons of user stories, bring on the tips. So, Put a number into the chat window uh, for me, and you can do it to all panelists or to everyone, just depends how integrated you wanna be with the dialogue. And I'm just kinda curious what our experience level is on the call. So, so far I'm seeing some very small numbers, a few, oh, now I got someone with hundreds and hundreds of them, excellent. So it looks like our experience level on the call is ranging from zero to hundreds, which is gonna be really fun. So I really, really encourage this chat window to continue. And if I talk about something that 
you're on the experience side of things and you've seen before, tell us about it. Say, hey, this happens all the time. And you can change your chat to do um, all panelists, I think, and attendees as well. So you can talk to each other as well, not just at, um, at me and the other panelists. So it's kind of fun to get that banter going and see who all on the call is resonating with each other's experiences here. So with our top 10 tips, we're going to go through all 10 tips. And, um, and we're going to get through the 10 tips to get your user stories kicked up a notch. So all right, are you ready for tip number one? Tip number one is, one second, um, put the user at the center. One of the most common things I see, and I do things like teaching and coaching agile teams and working with agile teams, but one of the most common things I see is that the user isn't at the center of the story. So with a user story, the sticky note you see on the screen that says, as a who, I want to what, so I can why. This is, let's call it a user story template if there is any meaning that you have to fill in the blank of the who, the what, and the why in a user story. And the who should always be the end user. In a lot of cases, that's an end customer, and sometimes it's an internal business user. But what that who should never, ever, ever be is it should never be a developer, a product owner, a stakeholder who made the request, another system, None of those things, the who is the user, because it's actually a user story. It's not the developer's story of what the developer needs to do, not the product owner's story. We are all about user stories and user interactions. And so for those of you that have never written user stories before, that's kind of cool information, right? And then there's those of you that have written lots of them, and some of you might be like, yep, I'm on it. But others of you might be like, wait a minute, it doesn't work that way where I am. My team writes system user stories and technical stories and all these other types of stories and the who isn't always a user. And I would say if you feel like you're in that situation, this is a big tip to pay attention to. It's a huge, huge, huge best practice tip that can really make your agile practices skyrocket to success and results when all of your user stories are from a user point of view. And I would love to hear any examples or questions about it. I was mentoring a group this morning on a call already where they were sending me examples of their user stories, saying, nope, this one isn't a user perspective, it's a technical thing. And when I backed them up a little bit, I said, no, that's a user perspective. So for example, if you've got a user story that you think is all about passing data between two systems, and you're like, no, there's no user, it's all technical. This morning I had a student, for example, that would say, well, no, it's, it's technical. And I said, well, what would happen if this data didn't get passed? Well, then a broker wouldn't get the information they needed back. Ah, here we go. That means our broker is actually the user. So as a broker, I need to get this information when I submit this information so that I can continue to work with my client on XYZ. So there's always a reason that we build the technology. We don't build technology for technical sake. We build it for our customers and for our users. So I'm really going to challenge you to search for every user story's user meaning. All right. So I'm just trying to flip screens. There we go. All right. So another thing that commonly happens with teams is that they get trapped into the technical details. If you see that graphic in that red question mark, you've got this team member trapped in the bottom of the question mark. And this is what happens when we write stories without that user point of view. We get trapped into the technical details and our user stories become all technical and task driven, meaning the tasks that the team has to do, add this button, upload this database, upgrade this server, those are not user stories, right? So what happens is when we look at the business analyst role is that the business analyst role is to get the context and shared understanding to the team and confirmed with stakeholders on who benefits from the change you want to make and why. If we write it from a technical point of view, 
or a task point of view, the team just doesn't have that understanding and we end up missing the mark, causing us to have enhancements and defects and missed expectations. And this ultimately breaks down trust between your business customers and the team of the technical team. And that's just not what we want. The other thing that happens is if it's written from a technical point of view or um, a task point of view, it makes impact and gap analysis nearly impossible. Now, if you're new to user stories, I also want you to think about this in terms of regular requirements. Your regular requirements can benefit from these tips as well. So rest assured, your regular requirements can have these same downfalls if the user is missing from them. Uh, testing becomes really difficult if they're not written from a user point of view because your test team doesn't know how to imagine the test scenarios and they can't set up the scenarios and environments that they don't really understand how to test it end to end. One of my biggest issues with user stories not written correctly is business leaders that just can't prioritize. If you give them a bunch of technical requirements to look at or technical stories, how do they prioritize them? And that's when they start disengaging and saying they don't have time for the project team. And that's a really difficult position to be in. So if we want to get engagement from our business leaders and our business teams, we need to speak in their language from a customer point of view. Now, a group of BAs I was recently working with said, oh, but we don't really know what the users do. So we have to write them technical. And I would call that a major red flag and a really big problem, right? As business analysts, we must understand the user point of view. And if we don't, we need to go out and shadow them, watch them, do their job, do whatever it takes because you are representing them. So as a business analyst, remember that business analyst, customer analyst, it's not technical analyst. You've got a whole tech team worrying about the technology. The other thing that happens is team transparency is lacking and others don't understand what the team is working on. So when you're Backlog items and stories are written from a technical or task point of view. Others don't really understand what's going on with it and the transparency is lost. So again, mistrust gets built with, with the team and with their stakeholders because even though they think they're being transparent, nobody can understand how they're communicating and what they're really working on. And of course, the BA role is front and center to this, right? That's our job, to be the liaison, to be the translator but are we really being the translator if we're writing technical things in our stories and requirements? So how many of you are seeing technical language or task language in your requirements and user stories? Can anyone give me a, a, a yay out on the chat line? Are you seeing this pattern that we can get this tip to fix it? Make it from a user point of view. Awesome. Just trying to switch the slide again. See if it goes. There we go. All right, we're on to our number two tip. And this again goes to user stories and requirements in general. And that is to keep the user action precise. So what do I mean by keeping the user action precise? I mean that it's so often that our user stories have some type of user goal in them, or at least they should, right? So in our last tip, we talked about the who part of the user story. And in this tip, we're talking about the what part of the story, the verb, the action that the user is trying to perform. Really great requirements work, user stories included. Talk about what the user's goal is. So for example, my goal as a user when I'm shopping on Amazon Prime, for example, is to find something, to browse items, to put something in my cart, to purchase something, to update or signal my shipping information, to pay for it and choose a credit card or an account or a, a, a gift card to pay with. Those are all my actions. So the idea that I want to buy something online can break down into all these smaller little actions. In, each of those are user stories. So then I have a who, I'm a customer on amazon.com, for example, my what, I wanna browse items, select items, view details of items, compare items, I wanna put items in my cart, I wanna remove items from my cart, I wanna view my cart, I wanna change the quantity of my cart, I want to select a checkout, I want to enter my shipping information, select a shipping option, confirm my purchase, 
select a credit card option, enter a new credit card, enter my name, enter my credit card number, enter my expiration date, enter my CCV code. Oh my gosh, we could go on and on and on. Maybe there's 50 different user stories to buy an item online. And I'm sure anybody who's working on any digital process to buy something online would have all of those user stories as well. So that's the what. It's an action verb. Now the magic about this tip is that these action verbs can't be mushy. And this goes for all of your requirements, not just user stories. But we want to avoid mushy words in our user stories, requirements, our models and diagrams that we use, as well as our acceptance criteria. Now I've got some examples of mushy words on the screen. Manage, monitor, review, process, administer, coordinate, align, support, synchronize, facilitate, analyze, control, track, develop. These are words to avoid. We really want words that are more precise. Things like, I want to view, I want to enter, I want to provide, I want to select. Things that are very action oriented, that are testable. You see, the problem with mushy words is that they can be misinterpreted and understood many different ways by many different people in many different contexts. So that makes them just difficult in general to do requirements with because then developers and testers might interpret them different than you or the stakeholder. In fact, you might interpret them different than your stakeholder intended. And so when you have four to 10 different people, maybe more, reading a mushy word and assuming what it means, you have chaos. And you have missed requirements, bad requirements, and missed expectations. Anybody seen any mushy words in their requirements lately? I beg you to take a look at your requirements document and you'll find plenty of them. Our goal is to fix them, tighten them up, and get to the real user action. Now let's look at an example of how this can transform a user story. So as a website user, I want to manage my profile so that I can keep my information up to date. Manage is the user goal, and in this tip number two, to keep the user action precise, we wanna identify manage as a mushy word. And we wanna replace the mushy word with a more actionable word that's testable, and that we can really agree on and break down into smaller parts. So here are some examples. As a frequent customer, I wanna update my credit card information on my profile so I can make one-click purchases. Or as a buyer of online goods, I wanna be able to update the shipping address for my profile so items get shipped to the correct address when and if I move. So the word update here is replacing the word manage. But we could also have other words replace the word manage, like print, view, sort, edit, replace, delete, all kinds of different words could go in here. You see the danger of mushy words? So something to be really, really careful of on these mushy words. All right, our user story tip number three. All user stories need acceptance criteria. Acceptance criteria is the detail. So the kind of agile way of thinking about this is that a user story can fit on a sticky note and the acceptance criteria can fit on the back. And what we don't want is like 50 page specifications of acceptance criteria. Acceptance criteria also states from a user point of view and it's not super technical, but it describes in detail without getting technical what needs to happen for this user story to be accepted as working as intended. So, something really important about that description. It's not about the technical details to build. It's describing how the user intends to interact. Intend is the key word. There's not technical details here. So, we'll look at some examples, but just to review, good acceptance criteria about a user story from a user point of view, not technical, not full of team to-dos, it's in plain English. This is where you put your scenarios, your rules, your conditions, and your non-functional requirements. So let's look at this example. As a frequent customer, I wanna update my credit card information on my profile 
so I can make one click purchases. Let's look at the acceptance criteria. Take a few moments to just take a look at how this acceptance criteria is written and how detailed it gets, yet it's in plain English. Tasks are not listed for the technical team to do. Buttons, fields, screens are nowhere to be found. I'm gonna pause for a few moments and let you read these. Um, take a look. So what you notice here is a pattern called the Gherkin method, and that's the given, when, then statement. So given is the scenario that's in play. BAs do great work when they use scenario-driven analysis. So it's the scenario or preconditions. Now the when statement in the middle is the action. It's a more detailed action than the story itself. Again, avoiding mushy words. So here, the user story, again, is about updating credit card information. Now here, look how detailed we get without getting technical. When I select to edit my payment information, when I select to add a card, when I select to update existing um, card on my account, when I select Visa or MasterCard, right? So this is very, very, Interesting how we have this when statement that gets more detailed but isn't technical. So there's a comment coming in that PCI compliance at the bottom is actually pretty technical. Um, in some cases it can be, but PCI compliance is a business compliance thing that takes a lot of technical detail to implement. Um, but it's actually a business driver requirement. It's a business requirement to be PCI compliant. And actually if you look at like the PCI compliance requirements, they're, they don't specify what technology or how to do it, right? It says that data must be secure. It says that data can't be open to others. It says it must be encrypted. So even though that's a very technical implementation, it's, it's still a very business driving thing. I know in your organization though, it could be possible that the technical group drives it, um, but still it has a very business meaning to it, right? They wouldn't be doing it if the business couldn't run without that. So given when then, given the scenario or precondition, when the detailed user action, now the then statement is magical. The then statement is about the response the product or solution gives the user and that the user describes the response. So then I'm at which payment information, which payment type to update. So instead of then a window pops up with this field, think of it in terms of how do you describe that in plain English? I'm asked which payment type I wanna update. I'm asked to enter my credit card type. Um, then the card number, expiration date, name, address, and code fields are open for me to edit. Or then I get a message that tells me this. Or then I can update and store it and view it in my stored profile or then I'm asked to enter something, or then I can see something or view something. So these are very, very detailed acceptance criteria that are plain English. Now the magic of these is that these then can be used for testing. So your QA team would absolutely love this because think about how it helps them build test scenarios. Your business teams can also validate that these are valid scenarios that make sense for the context and their business environment. All right, let's look at number four. Tip number four, ask your QA testing person if it's testable. That's right, your requirements are all about talking to each other. User stories, it's about conversation. There's something called the three C's of user stories, the card, the confirmation, and the conversation. The card being the user story, the confirmation being the acceptance criteria to be confirmed, and the conversation being the conversation that's had between so many different groups of people. So 
with QA and testers, we want to have these conversations. We want to explore what are the scenarios, the exceptions, the options, and alternatives. When your stories are not from a user point of view and your actions aren't precise and you're not providing given when then scenarios, it's really, really hard to test. So a good practice is to involve your QA and testing resources and people on the team to make sure that they can understand your requirements. And they're really good at catching the, uh, the things that we typically do and might not catch ourselves. So let's look at how we can take our acceptance criteria and translate them into test cases. So with our frequent customer wanting to update credit card information, right, they're selecting credit cards, they're, um, they're selecting to update credit card information, et cetera. Here, it's easier to derive your test cases. So the scenarios and test cases, test that when I select to edit my payment information, I'm asked which payment type, and I can select each of them. It's kind of high-level test case that probably yield anywhere between three and 10 different tests, actually. Tested for credit cards, I can successfully edit American Express, MasterCard, and Visa. Again, tons of tests would come out of that. Tests that I can log in and out and log back in and buy something with the updated card. So these three descriptions of the test cases are great ones to collaborate with your business users and supporters on because that's real plain English business language. And if they know that you've tested these things and you're working to test those things, they're gonna start trusting our work better. Versus if it says, test this screen, test that screen, test this button, that doesn't work as well to build trust with our group of, of stakeholders. Okay, tip number five. Be collaborative and work with others to flesh them out. That's right, user stories is a collaboration. One person said, is famous for saying, that user stories are the start to a conversation. And I couldn't agree more. User stories are not meant to be a contract. They're not meant to be a specification that gets handed off without any conversation or dialogue. One of the agile principles is to have collaboration and conversation over detailed documentation, right? We value conversation and that we're gonna get higher quality work by simply talking about it versus documenting it. If I were to ask all of you to document exactly how you load your dishwasher, I'm sure you'd have gaps. And your users have gaps too when they tell us their requirements. But if we start talking about it and showing each other how we do it, all of a sudden there's a better understanding that can come through. And with that better understanding comes much better quality requirements and software from teams. So be collaborative. It's all about the conversation. When BAs are transitioning from a traditional environment to an agile environment, one of the major differences is that they have a lot more conversations and a lot less pounding on the keyboard. So it's not that there's no documentation or that we don't get to the details in agile. It's that we prioritize conversation to get through the work over documentation. And one of the ways this works is that Agile teams are working on very small amounts of work at one time. Instead of trying to spec out an entire project that might be 100 or 200 pages of requirements, Agile teams are typically working on smaller pieces or units at a time. So with smaller pieces of work, they don't have to have documentation to remember what they talked about. We have um, all kinds of visual models and things that help us remember the vision and the big picture so that we're not working blindly either without a vision and a, and a roadmap. But once we have that big picture and vision, we're working on small pieces at a time such that the conversation is what's important. The technical details, they can change. But the user goal and the acceptance criteria really don't change a whole lot. And we learn as we go and as we work that inform us that might adapt and change our user stories that are forthcoming yet. So that's why we only work on a little bit at a time because our learnings are going to inform what happens next with our user stories. So none of that can happen without conversation. It's a really, really, really powerful, powerful piece that as BAs we have to get more comfortable with when transitioning to um, a user story. A question came in, how, uh, so when user stories are justly handed over to the dev team and conversations are with managers and development, not actual coders. 
So thanks for that question coming in. I'm actually going to kind of turn that, that question on its head a little bit. When you work in an agile environment, we actually don't do handoffs. So user stories are not meant to be handed off like requirements are in the old way of working or the traditional way of working or waterfall. In agile, user stories are meant to be prioritized by the product owner. And then the product owner says, this is my top priority. And the team talks about it. So it's not a handoff. It's a, hey, everybody, here is what we're talking about next. So it's meant to be a dialogue, not a handover. And the dialogue happens between the product owner, business analyst, technical team, the actual coders. Sometimes managers are there, but not usually. It's usually directly with the developers. And uh, the users can be present as well, if that's appropriate on your team. Closer to the user, the better. So user stories, again, are not handoffs. They're conversations that are had. And this makes sense. If you think about an agile team, you probably have heard, oh, agile teams are co-located, and everyone sits together and works together. And that's exactly it. When you're co-located in the same physical space and working together, you can have these conversations quickly and just in time, and you're swarming together one user story at a time to get the work done. When you work in that style, it all of a sudden seems strange to stop and document and to hand off. It seems ridiculously counterproductive, almost like it's a tax on the team to have to pause and stop or wait. So Agile is just a different way of working all together, where we're all working together on one story, and we all work on developing and testing it together as well. And throughout that process, since we're all focused on one thing 100% all day long on that item until it's done, we're simply talking about it. And it seems absolutely silly to pause to write it down. You might have models hanging on the wall that get referenced, absolutely. You've got your story and acceptance criteria, Absolutely. Uh, question coming in. Uh, what about um, offshore and different time zones? So a lot of folks are dealing with offshore and different time zones. Absolutely. Basically, though, one thing with Agile that's kind of interesting is if you don't have overlapping time together with those offshore people on your team, it's going to slow you down. So as many handoffs as you have and you don't have the team working together is really just a recipe for slowing the team down. Uh, and I know it's not a constraint. You can just go walk in and change, right? But maybe perhaps in your organization, um, there could be a pilot team that doesn't have uh, offshore people on the team or everyone's in the same location. Or if you change your work hours slightly so there's more overlap, you can see the difference in productivity that's going on with the team. So food for thought. So with the conversation with user stories, one thing that's also really important to understand is that user stories iterate and evolve. It's not just that BAs go crank open a tool and pound them out on the keyboard all day long and all of a sudden they're in the backlog and get prioritized. User stories can start or initiate from all different types of people. It could be your users, your stakeholders, your team members on the team, even developers will have ideas for user stories. And also as a business analyst, you're analyzing the situation and the context of the project, you're going to come up with lots of potential user stories that might be gaps. But then how do you decide which ones to go after, which ones are legitimate, which ones are going to have the most bang for the buck and the most value? That's when you huddle and you model and you analyze and you huddle again with your team or business groups, different small huddles, different groups of people. We model again, we prioritize, we talk through scenarios. We experiment with unknowns. We look at options and alternatives. And we talk through all of this where the user story might get updated and the acceptance criteria multiple times throughout these conversations that happen. The conversations include discussion on what's the user context, what's the scenario. There's all types of things that have to be talked about to make sure the team is working on the right thing at the right time to get quick feedback loops from users and mitigate rework and guessing, right? The idea is not to guess. The longer we work without getting real user feedback, 
the higher risk we have of rework, bugs, and enhancements. Now, the shorter time intervals that we work where we can get real user feedback, and ideally for Agile teams, it's daily. So you're getting user feedback proactively daily, and then you know you're only working a couple hours at a time before knowing if you're on the right track. So it's super important to think about this user story process as an evolution. It's not a BAs sit and type at their keyboard. It's BAs get up and facilitate conversations and walk through models and talk about scenarios and what does the user do and what does the user see and, and find the gaps that aren't being stated. So super important. Number six, splitting and slicing user stories. It's a key skill for BAs and Agile teams because to get that feedback quicker, the team has some small user stories to work on. So it could be just that it's like update credit card information. No, let's split it and slice it into smaller ones. So we take update credit card information and it's update America Express, update Visa, update MasterCard. Oh, let's split them even smaller. Update my name on the credit card, update my credit card number, update my CCD code. Ah, that's three or four more for one of three that originated from one, now we're into like the 20 user story range from one original story. So that allows us to do the one smaller story, get feedback, see if we're on track. If we are, okay, great, let's do some more. And we can get that user-centered, value-centered, feedbackable story. And there's lots of different strategies. I just use the kind of data scenario with you on that credit card example. Uh, so down here, by data entry, one piece of data through the entire system process and back. But you could also do simple to complex. So if you're doing payments, for example, think about it like how about uh, the first thing we do on our website is PayPal. Super easy. It's just a link out to PayPal. And then in another user story, we add in gift cards. In another user story, we allow credit card payment, but it's only Visa. And then another user story or release is this. So really thinking about going simple to elegant or basic to complex. You could also break out your splits by personas, user roles, scenarios, lots of different strategies, but a super important way to keep your user stories small. So here's an example. As a job seeker, I wanna search for available jobs so I can find work. That's where the story starts, but it's too big for the team to work on and get anything done in a short amount of time. So we split it. We're not splitting it by technical component. We're not splitting it by developer task. We're not splitting it by the technical things that need to be done. We're splitting it from a user point of view. So search for jobs to find work. How about search for jobs by state or search jobs by function? by keyword, by location. All these different things are things that are smaller to build and I can still go get feedback on it and they can get prioritized. The best thing about splitting these out is maybe once we do a few top priority ones, the others don't even need to be done. Maybe we can move on and work on something else. And so this is a way to manage scope. Instead of agreeing to a full scope, we negotiate scope as we go. Because once your users or customers see the first few, they might go, well, that's good enough. I don't need the rest. It's a very different mindset than trying to jam in all the scope you can into a sign-off and making it a contract. Really what we're driving is scope to get a result, a result being maybe we need this many people to apply for this many jobs in a certain time period. What if the first two stories reach the goal and we don't need the rest? We call it trimming the tail in Agile. We don't have to do work if we've already met the goal. The question is, do we know what goals we're trying to meet from a user and business perspective? Number seven, make your user stories feedbackable. I may have invented a new word here, feedbackable. If anyone wants to look that up, let us know on the chat window if that's a real word or not. But what do I mean by it? I mean that every single user story you write you need to be able to show real working software to your customers, to your users, and they should be able to use it and get feedback. So very, very, very important part of Agile, that your user stories are independent and valuable, meaning you can get feedback from your users. You can show and tell, and they can 
go on and try it out themselves, roll up their sleeves, hands on the keyboard. I can do it. I can see it. Hey, this is what I like and don't like about it. Feedbackable. Can your users see the progress and give you feedback? This isn't showing them code or database tables or configuration screens. It's showing them the real stuff they'd be using, even though it might not be complete. So it might only be one portion of a screen, but it's a goal we're building and showing them. So this isn't about building full screens, full components. It's showing little pieces at a time and building on to the last piece and getting feedback as you go. So you talk about feedback rounds plus story split, that's when teams see the real magic of Agile, and it's magical. We learn quicker, we innovate quicker, and we get results quicker. So when we think about different types of feedback, a lot of times teams are getting daily feedback or even more often. It, think users and product owners and business stakeholders coming and checking in with the team and seeing the team's work multiple times per day because the team is working on small enough pieces that are feedbackable. Um, you can also look at after a sprint iteration where we can get continued feedback after they've used more pieces together and get feedback on how to improve it. And then those items become user stories to get prioritized. So the feedback you get during or after might become a higher priority than building something new. And that's the product owner's decision to make. But the BA helps facilitate those dialogues and making sure those user stories represent. Our eighth tip, it's okay not to implement all user stories. That's right. I like to say that over half, oh, maybe I'll go 80% of your backlog should never be built. Think about that. Think about half to 80% of your backlog never even built. Why? because requirements change too quickly. If you've got an item on your backlog for even six months, let's say, chances are your user either doesn't need it or their needs have changed from what's currently on the backlog. So it could be that that item changed or something else is just simply more important. So it's really important to think about your backlog in terms of like a funnel shape and that the bigger items are on the top, release items kind of in the middle and fringe smaller items on the bottom, and that we're constantly shifting the priorities and the winds are changing the priorities. You wanna have things organized and prioritized and split. So you have these big stories that get split into release level stories and then split again into sprint level stories. Now, once they're in each bucket, they don't necessarily have to be ranked. I just know it's release level and it's further back. But I do wanna have about 10 stories ranked, one, two, three, four, five, all the way to 10 at any given time. So just thinking about not all of your stories have to be done and you don't have to have a perfectly stacked backlog. But really, really important we understand that our backlog evolves as we go and we keep changing it as we learn. It's a holistic thing that we need to analyze. The backlog is, is a really powerful thing that BAs work on. Items should be regularly removed from backlogs. They should be added. Priorities should be changing. Product owners should be changing them on a regular basis based on market conditions and feedback from users, stakeholder discussions, data insights, and innovation. It's not a to-do list, rather a holistic, evolving, dynamic list of priorities where things get changed, removed, and added. Also, thinking about your backlogs, you want to prioritize for innovation. Is there a way to solve for a problem that brought on the request instead of just performing the request? So many times these requests are just potential ideas for solutions to solve problems. But really our goal as BAs is to just solve problems, not just implement someone else's idea of how to solve a problem. So we can be more consultative and strategic as BAs by looking at the backlog holistically, analyze it for themes, innovate and make less work to solve the problem. You might only have to take one of these items change it a little bit, adapt it a little bit, and it all of a sudden deletes 10 other items on the backlog. But you've got to look at that backlog more holistically and analyze it to get there. Number nine, make the why meaningful. In your user stories, that last part, you so that, that's the why. And too many times as BAs, we get lazy about the why statement. So let's look at an example. 
as a checking account holder, I want to check my balance so I know how much money I have. Huh. So I know how much money I have. That's the why statement. Is that really why you check your bank balance? When I tend to have conversations about this and ask people, why do they check their bank balance? I get answers more like this. Well, I need to see if my paycheck cleared or if I have enough money to buy something that I'm looking at and that I want or to see if a check that I wrote went through or a transaction. Or maybe you share an account with somebody and you need to see what's going on in the account and what types of expenses have been logged or not logged. So to see how much money I have is a little bit of a lazy why statement, whereas if we were building the check balance function, if we didn't understand that it was about looking at previous transactions to see if a paycheck cleared, for example, we might not build it to be able to view all those things. Why? You said you just wanted to see how much money you have. It didn't say that we need to see that we needed all the details of checks that cleared and other things that have happened, right? So let's think about this. That's kind of a lazy user story to see how much money I have because all that tells us is it's just about the one number, but I think we all know we don't just look at the one number. So by putting a powerful why statement, it eggs on even more powerful dialogue and conversation to get higher quality stuff built for our customers that will yield less defects and less enhancements and ultimately make them trust us and be happier along the way. So our why statements are typically along the lines of saving someone time, having them better connect, uh, getting disparate information into a unique view perhaps, reducing anxiety or connecting people to one another are common why statements that end up in user stories. Our last Tip, keep the technical details out. And I know we've touched on this a little bit, but things like add a button to a screen, upgrade to the next version, refresh this or that, install, update API, those are technical details. They're not user stories. And I know a lot of you run teams that have things like this on your backlog, but I'm telling you, your business won't be engaged in the dialogue if this is what it's all about. They're just gonna be like, go get it done and let me know when it's done. What your business leaders really care about is results. But those results from a customer user point of view. So we've got to translate that technical back into business language. What does that button on a screen do and for who and why? Then we get our user story, right? For who, so that, and, and what they're doing. So instead of add an okay button to a screen, how about, as a Amazon.Prime customer, I want to select to check out so that I can buy my items in my cart. Maybe that's an OK button at the bottom of a screen, but okay, that doesn't tell us what it's about, what the customer's trying to do, what the customer goal is. Same with these other items. Keep the technical detail out. Why do we want to upgrade to another version? Why refresh this? Why update or install this? Think about what's the user impact is your main question. So let's look at this one, a bad user story. As a developer, I need to update the database with a new table so we can track user usage data. I would say, nope, breaks a lot of our rules, right? Not a good story. How about this one? As a marketing manager, I need to view user habits when browsing products so I can gain insights into user behaviors and use these insights to market and create new products. There we go. There's the business point of view. Who needs to do what and why? That's the context. Because you know what, that database, that new table, that doesn't guarantee we did anything positive for the business. And they paid for it? Really? Right? So that's what we have to think about. We are the consultants to make sure that our business and customers get value from the money they're spending on technology. Super important. Another way to think about user stories is to write it in order to statement. In order to speed up the application process, we need to upgrade the database to a new version. So what I did is put in the business case, speeding up the user process. That's a business, plain English, user-centric way of describing what we want to do. And then that task at the, at the end. So here's another example. In order to increase the number of users to over 10,000, we need to upgrade the database to version 9.3. So this helps business leaders make decisions on what user stories to prioritize. 
They can't make a decision if it just says upgrade the database. They're just like, why would I do that? Right? So we have to put this why. If you're running this business, if you're spending the money, how do you know what to spend on? We all have to do this in our personal lives all the time, right? We don't want our handymen coming to us for our, in our houses telling us to fix a bunch of technical things. What do we ask? Well, what does it do for me? We don't buy a new dishwasher just because a new version comes out. What does it do for me? Only if it does something that's worth the money to get me a different result. That's the type of information and conversations we have as BAs. So another one, in order to speed up the process for authenticating user IDs when customers are logging in, we need to refactor the code for the integration to the API and tune the database. So now I can prioritize this. If it just says refactor code and tune the database, a business leader can't prioritize that. If it says it'll speed up the login process, now I'm interested. Now I care about the money I'm spending. So that BA role of ours is to facilitate decision-making amongst the business and technology team together, right? You're helping people make decisions and priorities. Well, that was a mouthful. We've got five minutes left, and I'm ready for more questions from you guys. So which of these tips do you think is the most powerful for you? You can put that in on the chat window, put a question in with it as well. Yes, thank you, Angela, for all the information you shared. Um, as uh, she mentioned, feel free to enter your questions in the chat panel. We'll have a couple more minutes left um, to answer any questions you have. Looks like uh, we have someone chiming in saying, leaving out the technical details is a good learning point and a, a good tip. Mm -hmm. Can we show number eight again? Absolutely. Well, um, actually, Anna, I think you are... Yeah. Can you control back to number eight? Okay, and number eight is it's okay to not implement all stories. So yeah, so that one is you know where you can um, think about it like not every story is a demand. Think about it as I've got a list of things I would love to do in my home. Does that mean all of them are gonna get done in the order I thought of them? Or might new things come up and uh, become more important based on new information? Acceptance criteria to keep out details is most important to me. Thank you very much for that comment. Absolutely. Love how to word technical upgrades and getting user buy-in for that. Thank you. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you for these comments and questions. So, mm -hmm. is there any tip that we can go into more detail on for anybody? Well, here's a question that came in. Do you think there can be a gap in perception when the business side or user stories are given that technical people might not understand it? Absolutely. That happens all the time, right? But that's why we have the conversation. So the good thing to worry about is as a BA and being an agile team, user stories aren't about getting them to perfect before anybody else sees them, right? It's about having a conversation. So the best way is to get the business and users and technical folks all talking about it. And the best way to do that is just plain English. And, and the technical people on your team need to understand the business and user perspective before they can jump to technical solutions, right? So it's our duty as BAs to make sure they don't jump to solution too quickly. And that's how we do it, by providing the user perspective first and making sure they ask questions about it and understand it. Only then, can we even entertain any technical solutions? Otherwise, what are we talking about? We don't even know the problem, right? So yes, there's a gap, but that's what conversation's all about. Mm -hmm. Are user stories primarily agile or used in waterfall as well? Uh, good question. More and more people are using user stories in waterfall environments as well. It's mainly driven by trying to have consistent requirements practices when your organization is working in both environments, um, or waterfall teams will do it in preparation for knowing that they're gonna be transitioning to Agile soon. So really, really popular, popular um, technique to use no matter what approach you're using.
Great, so that's okay. all the time we have for today. Um, if you have any questions that you think of later or that we didn't get to address today, feel free to send them to me um, at the email listed on this screen. That's anna.yoshida at uci.edu. And if it's a question for Angela, I'll go ahead and forward it to her um, so she's able to answer the questions that you have. Um, we hope you enjoyed this webinar and gained a ton of insight into the business analyst profession and user stories. If you saw any spring 2019 courses that piqued your interest, uh, please remember to register early and consider adding our fully online business analysis certificate program uh, to your professional portfolio. Again, this slide has my contact information, so feel free to contact me if you have any questions. Uh, thank you again, Angela, and have a great day, everybody. Thank you, everybody.